when you hear the term for the least of them, you may think of a biblical scenario where Jesus talks about for the least of them. Fred Wynn wrote a book called For the Least of These. Fred Wynn served as a correctional officer, a librarian, and a case management in Soledad Prison. In this book, he talks about how the prison industrial complex, the penal system, treats for the least of them. Thank you for joining me, Fred. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, Fred, let's, let's uh, talk about the title of the book. The, the least of these comes out as a biblical term. Uh, explain why did you this title and why did you take this particular title? Well, it comes from the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. And in this chapter, in this particular passage, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's given an illustration about basically who's going to make it to heaven and who will not. And he says basically that you have to, um, when you show kindness to different groups, you're showing kindness to him. Uh, he uses the example of refugees, um, all these terms stranger, he uh, says prisoners. He goes, uh, when you came to visit me in prison, then you were, you were being kind to me. And people would say, well, what, we, we never visit you in prison. He said, well, you did it to the least of these, uh, then you did it for me. So he ident Christ identifies with people that are on the bottom of society. He identifies with the have-nots. He identifies with people that are othered, that are mistreated, uh, the downtrodden. And so that's why I chose the title, because that's the image that inmates have, uh, you know, and other groups too, refugees, you know, poor people. Okay. Yeah, so that's why I chose it. I, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, who is Fred Wynn? Good question. Well, I was born in the 50s, grew up in the Bay Area, Oakland, California, went to Oakland Public Schools. When I finished high school, I went to Cal State Hayward, which is called something else now. But I went there for a couple of years. I finished up my undergraduate work at UC Santa Barbara, which is a beautiful campus out in Southern California. In Oakland, when I was growing up, the Black Panthers were very active. Uh, there were, you know, King assassination, the Malcolm X assassination, and, and the general upheaval that was taking place uh, in society in general. So I was a product of all that. And I saw major changes. Uh, the, the civil rights movement produced, and uh, that's sort of who I am. Okay, and and I and when I was reading the book and I and I did some uh, crypt notes, I noticed that your your storytelling method. And I want our audience to really be mindful of this particular way method that you use. Your storytelling method is that you're taking actual stories and actual events, and you introduce it and saying, well, this is a story about, do you do a postscript on it, uh, more or less ex uh, uh, explaining what you thought of it, but the body of it is actually the story of the individual or, or person. Why did you use this particular method, which is very effective? Well, thank you. I, wanted, I had an uh, agenda. I wanted to convey certain concepts in each story. Now, to be fair, the stories that I talk about is not just one person. For example, we talked about inmate Oliver, education of inmate right. Oliver. That was really quite a few inmates uh, that had a similar experience. Right. So I want to really highlight that education opportunities, uh, evocational training, um, psychological uh, Counseling, right. these things are very important for inmates to develop these skills and, and to uh, move on, move forward in life. But a lot of people, too many people, are against that. It's just wasting money. But most inmates are returned to society at some point. So it's to our own advantage to have them being able to, um, to have a successful reentry, mm -hmm. to have a better shot at being successful. Otherwise, they're just going to return, and that's, that's just a, a waste of uh, their life. 
and society will suffer because that's one person that's not contributing to the, the, the extent of his full abilities or her abilities. So that's kind of why I did that. I, I want you know, to convey and, a certain message. And, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I was laughing at some of the stories because I, I've seen myself in the story, like you say, Oliver. I was Oliver in the Merlin prison system. I came in, I was a substance abuse uh, prior to being arrested. I had a, a opted out of society in and of itself. And when I got, when I went to the prison, they tested you when you first came in. And I had a third grade reading level and a sixth grade math level. But back when I went through the system, they didn't have mandatory education, but in, in California, they had mandatory education. And so Oliver, uh, and like you say, not this is Oliver. Oliver is everybody that's had the same kind of background, educational background. Oliver chose right. not to go to school, and because he chose not to go to school, they uh, put him in a, 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 a restrictive housing area that minimized his activities. But once he decided, once he was able to go to school, he got privileges. Do you think that th this was because the California prison system was concerned about men and women being educated and would help them have a better chance of surviving in society, or was this just something that was mandated by the uh, state legislators? Yes, I believe this was mandated. Um, I, I would have to check, but I know that it was required. Right. Uh, you have to have a sixth grade level, but many people did not want a lot of uh, the inmates. Now I actually want to go to the yard. I just want to make some money. And you can kind of understand them wanting to work to get money to buy uh, the soap and all that kind of stuff. Um, however, I believe it was the, 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 the legislature that, that required this, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Okay. But, and let's, let's look at, <clears throat> let's unpack some of the stories, right? Cause like we say about Oliver, but then you had the one that, that, uh, and, and going back to what you say about the education system, cause they took the Pell Grant out when they took the Pell Grant out, yes. uh, yes. the, under yes. the crime bill, this, I'm just, uh, uh, right digress a little bit, when they took the Pell Grant out under the crime bill, that opened the door in, in, in the prison system for the proliferation of gangs because prior to the Pell Grant being taken out, most people was going to colleges, most people was like, uh, uh, had seen the value in education, education had transformed the prison population. But let's talk about uh, one of your jobs in the correction system was librarian and as, and, I, and, I, and I was going over how you was talking about selecting, you know, the process of being a librarian, uh, trying to get a clerk. With, with, and, mm. But more importantly, we'll talk about the clerk because that was another story in and of itself. But I, like, I want you to talk about uh, when you came in and you decided to overhaul a library and get more books. Talk about the black books. Well, I was living in the Bay Area prior to moving down there, and I worked in a library, and it was just standard practice. Whatever library you're working at, if you're working in a Hispanic area, then you want to have books about Hispanics. If you're working in a, you have other books too, but you, you know, you want to cater to your audience. If you're working in an Asian neighborhood, you want to have those type of books. So we we're at a prison, and it was sort of like a public library. We had a large percentage of, of Hispanics. Uh, Blacks, then we had others, then we had whites. So I want to build a collection to reflect that. So I really didn't give that any thought. I just want to start ordering books. I went to a, um, actually I went to a bookstore in Oakland called Marcus Books, I believe, and ordered some books. And I was with some other li librarians uh, throughout the state. And so then uh, I get a call from my um, supervisor. Hey, I need to talk to you. So I go in there thinking, okay, what's up? And he said, hey, uh, the warehouse says that you, 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 you ordered some, some black books. And I'm thinking, okay, well, there's more to the story, right? And I look at it and go, yeah. And he goes, well, we've never had black books here before. Well, what do you mean you haven't had black books? I mean, you've had black inmates, right? And, uh, well, yeah, yeah, we have black inmates. We had them when I came in 20 years ago. So, well, what's wrong? You know, so he went on. And what happened was uh, somebody in the warehouse had written a letter to the warden complaining about having black books. So my supervisor had to justify the book. So he was trying to get for me why I ordered black books. So I told him, hey, you know, uh, 
these are not just black books, these are books from American history. And the reason why they exist is because American history books do not include the stories of, of, of people of color. And um, that's when I was building a collection to reflect the um, inmate population. Right. That has some Hispanic books for me, that has some Native American books on order. And so then that, that, that saw this project. Oh, no problem. He had this answer for the award. So that was a, that was a lesson for me to, to, he was not anti-black books. He just needed an answer to his problem at the moment to respond to the ward. Um, so, and I had other issues too with with, with books, but that's that's that story. And, and I think I think you know, when, for the benefit of our audience, you you and uh, Solar Day, uh, you and uh, the California prison system, and this is like in the eighties. Uh, this is on the heels of uh, George Jackson. This is on the heels of the San right. Quentin Six. This is on the heels of a, right. a, a, a serious upheaval in San Quentin, Folsom, uh, and these other institutions. Right. And I think that uh, we was talking earlier that you say when you came in, the number of prisons that existed versus when you left, the number of prisons that existed. So, you know, it, in terms of, I can, I can identify what you're saying about this individual, but the, the general politics of the, uh, the correction system back then was that because of, uh, George Jackson, uh, because of the education, it, it became like a, a, a more, they looked at prisons as being more uh, 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 incubated for alternative thought, revolutionary thought. So that might have had a lot to do with it. But talk about, talk about the uh, space cadet. And, and the reason why I want you to talk about the space cadet because uh, in, in prison, and when, when you was talking about it, I thought about, uh, a guy that was in, in the prison where I was at, and he had, uh, he was real knowledgeable with the Bible. And mm. so, and when he first came in, that's, you know, he was, he was really into that, going to church and, and uh, you know, worshiping his God as he saw him. And, but he was real knowledgeable, he was real well read in the Bible. Uh, for whatever reason, he had like had mental health. He had a mental health issue, so he he mm. lost he like lost his uh, faculty to to deal with reality. And so he used to walk around and just like just randomly, like wherever you was at, just start spewing out Bible verses, and and when nobody mm. there, when nobody looking at him or nothing, he just be like. And so we had a term for we had a term that we used to call him. Uh, to our ignorance uh, that we would call him. But then they started calling him the prophet. So talk about the space cadet. Okay. Well, my, my point in that story was the fact that we needed uh, mental health counseling and training and, and, and awareness and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there was an inmate that came to the, to the library, and we had all kinds of people there, and he um, wanted to talk to me. And that, that, you know, sometimes they had issues that they needed to address or things they thought I could help them with. So, I, you know, he comes in and he, um, he's from outer space and he has these issues he's trying to, you know, address. They want him to get back on the mothership and head out of, you know. And I'm looking at him thinking, this, this guy is, you know. But then this, this, this my mentor comes in and um, I say, hey, you know, um, you know, he maybe can help us with this problem. So um, the inmate, Space Cadet talks to my 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 mentor and um, tells him, hey, you know, I'm out of, I'm from out of space and blah 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 blah. And so um, my my colleague, hey, guess what? I'm from out of space too. And he said, hey, you know what you need to do is put your hat on a certain way to block the um the the, the radio waves. And he said, now you know they're gonna call you to a mental health office pretty soon. I need you to go there and talk to him. And so he uh, calmed the guy down. The guy was all happy because, you know, somebody else from out of space, too, and we, uh, we could take care of his problem. Yeah. And so then he called the, uh, he called the uh, office, the mental health department, and they came and, 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 and took him away and put him somewhere else. Yeah, so and, my and, point of that story is that, go ahead. Yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. And, and I think that, you know, for the benefit of our, our listeners and uh, our audience is that this is the part of the, this is part of the book or, or this is the, the part of the storytelling that uh, 
shows the 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 underbelly of the uh, of the prison system, the prison industrial complex, in terms of like the pressure right. that a lot of us, the trauma that we go through while we're incarcerated, uh, and our and the evil in most institutions they don't have uh, uh, people that's like sensitive towards a person that succumb to the pressure of being incarcerated for lengthy periods of time. In some institutions they do. In this in this case, it looked like it seemed that uh, y'all had, you know, with you and your mentor, y'all had a sense of humanity towards the persons and making sure that they got uh, the proper treatment that they needed. Was that the case? Well, yes, because there are a lot of people that have issues, right? And they didn't really have that, uh, that program set up at Soledad at that time. But the mental health department, the psychologist, psychiatrist interviewed him, and then they removed him from that prison, and they sent him somewhere else where he could get help. Um, that has really changed. Though. Now they have uh, so many different programs, and due to lawsuits that occurred while right. I was there, they have whole institutions that deal just with mental health issues and with medical issues. So I, I'm, I'm happy to say that that is no longer when I left anyway. That was no longer a major, major issue. They had entire uh, units that only housed mental health inmates, and they got, you know, training, and they got uh, daily um, activities geared for them, and they're able to address their concerns. And and then too, in 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 your uh, storytelling, you go from. And I, and I, like I say, it's effective for me. It was an effective uh, writing style. You go from like you got a story, but then you come and you do do like what might be considered social commentary on uh, historical pers- conditions, uh, like transition in prison. I think that was uh, one of the uh, topics. Talk about why did you see the need to like interject? Uh, this, these subject matters within this within this uh, book, when when it's like even though it's premised on a lot of actual events that's taking place, the historical information that you provide or the uh, commentary you provide is consistent with what's going on in society. Why, why do you see the need to 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 do it like that or or bring that in like that or not just taking write a book on historical perspective? a prison and uh, social conditions as it relates to why prison are like they are. Why do you use this particular method? I want to to humanize it. I want to put it in a way that people can relate to it and understand it. There are a lot of things I did not understand about their lives, their inmate lives prior to coming to prison. And um, for example, I think I, in some part in the book, I talked about the fact that um, it makes with, uh, prior to coming to prison, they'd be in the car with their friends. The police would pull them over, right. line them up against the wall, uh, photograph them, get their AKA, you know, get the information, and then let them go because they hadn't done anything. They were not suspected of any crime. The police were just uh, just getting information about them. And, you know, if you grow up in that environment, what are you going to think about the country that you live in? Um, are you going to, you, you go to school, the, the teacher tells you that, you have all these rights, and then you realize these rights do not extend to you. The, the, you, have, you have the right against uh, uh, seizure, I mean, uh, being stopped and searched and all that stuff without cause. But this doesn't extend to you. So what are, you, what are, what are your views uh, of America? So I want people to kind of see that, because most people don't, don't really, um, are not aware of that. And the war on drugs imprisoned millions of uh, well, hundreds of thousands of African-Americans. During the period where I was working there, it was alleged that um, members of a certain administration in Washington was instrumental in dumping crack cocaine in Southern California in black communities. Um, So you dumped the, the, the crack there, people got addicted to it, then other agencies came and arrested them and put them in prison. That was right. a, a setup. And people don't really understand that. If you're not from that environment, if you don't have anyone that went through that, you don't believe that kind of stuff. But it, it really does happen. It really did happen. Um, right. 
and and I think I think that that's why I was asking about why did you make that uh, use this particular method because that's what it does. It 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 gives a story. It 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 gives events, right. and then it, and then so when you come with the the commentary, uh, a person that can make an be able to make an objective de uh, decision on to believe or not to believe, but at least they have enough information to say, well, if uh, uh, you putting crack cocaine in the neighborhood, the prison population explodes, uh, and then these are these are the people that these these are the things that go on in this and population that you created. But talk about uh, Grant's tomb, because uh, one of the things I noticed that when I was locked up, <clears throat> and I spoke on this earlier, was about the literacy rate in the uh, prison. And when after I got after I got my GED, I started teaching reading and writing. But before I started teaching reading, I didn't know, I really didn't know that people couldn't read. And I was in a cell with a guy that couldn't, that couldn't read. And, uh, and he, when he got letters from his, uh, his daughter, uh, his, uh, female friend about his daughter, he would always have to get somebody to read him. And I wind up in the cell with him. And ultimately he, we, we got him to be able to read any guy's GED. But talk about Grant's tomb because this is another part of the uh, storytelling method uh, and information that's being conveyed that I think our audience would be able to understand, mainly when it comes to their family members, that the necessity for investing in certain things when it comes with the prison industrial complex. Well, when I got there, I uh, invited hundreds of people to come and bring their classes, teachers and bring their classrooms to the library. So like a little field trip, but I wanted to expand the library services, and I wanted the inmates to know that the library was a um, place that was a useful place for them to hang out. It contained information that uh, that they could use. So this um, one of the first classes to come over, um, I had developed a little quiz, right, as a teaching method. I had different reference tools, like I think current biography and um, almanac and things like that. And I was, there was one of the questions was like, uh, what's the address of, I think it was a uh, popular singer, I won't say her name, but a popular singer at the time. What is her address? And they are all excited because they oh, they'll, they'll get to write to her. And I had other little questions, but at the start of the, um, the, the I want to give them confidence in using the library. So I put what I thought was a very easy question for number one. The question was, who is buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> I figured it would get confident and go to question number two, right? And then number three. But after like a half hour, I walked around the room and they were all on the first question. They were going through the books trying to find out who was buried in Grant's tomb. <laughs> um, you know. So anyway, I told him, hey, well, you know, boom, 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 boom. And then one guy said, uh, oh, this, 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 uh, this test insults my intelligence. But they all kind of laughed. And I had cats and saved up some magazines I was going to throw out. I said, I'll give them magazines if you get the answers right. So I gave out the magazines anyway. But out of that class, several members, they all either finished, reached the sixth grade, or they transferred out before they did. And some of them stayed and they got their GED. At least one person stayed there and he became a college graduate um, from the local community mm. college. And then others went on and went to the vocational uh, trades and got a vocation. That's when they had that there. So I want to show that once again, uh, these um, programs are worthwhile. Once the inmate has a skill um, that he can market and get a job, then he has a better chance of survival, of surviving, making it on his own once he, once he gets out. So that was sort of the point of that story. I want to make it that really did happen. I was trying to make it amusing so people would, would read it, but then they would uh, make the connection. Well, maybe we should have uh, money for educational purposes or uh, money for vocational training and, and have college, you know, back in the, because they had all these college programs, but then they, they stopped all that. Right, right. And, you know, that was horrible. That was one of the worst things they could have done. Yeah, because when they, when they took their pill, I remember the crime because I was going to a uh, college in the, uh, in the Maryland prison, we had what they call the extension college extension program, and in, in the district in this area region down here, each uh, college uh, took a 
uh, the prison population. Like if the if the institutions was in the one region, then Morgan where Morgan State was at, Morgan State HBCU would be the college that serviced them. If it's in the Baltimore sir, area, Coppin State would be an HBCU that would service them. And you're in the Western Maryland wow, part, okay. it was Frostburg. But what happened and, and what was going on during that time, all of us that was like in, in the institution, it changed, the, it changed the institution because now people are more educated and the conversations are more a long line of being more mm -hmm. informed. Once they took them Pell Grants mm -hmm. out, that opened the door for the proliferation of and the infestation of gangs. But, but uh, Fred, talk about why all lives don't matter. Because you, you had a, a, as you go on, you delve deep into like a lot of the social uh, agenda issues. And, and, you, and you do it from a perspective that it has a, a, a slight religious overtone in and of itself, but I want you to explain that, you know, your, what, your view on that and why you, why you chose to interject it in this, in this book. Well, originally I was just going to write about different stories about the inmates and hope, in hopes to dissuade young people from traveling down a certain path, right? Uh, but then while I was writing, I, it took me several years. I write a bit and I put it down for a month or two. Uh, the pandemic hit, but the George Floyd tragedy occurred. And I didn't really watch the whole video. I saw the, the, the initial part. And they, they said he had a $20 counterfeit bill, I think it was. But you don't get the death penalty for having a counterfeit bill. Right. You don't even get the death penalty if you, if you have a counterfeit, if you have a machine in your house pumping out, pumping out money. You don't, you don't die. They don't, they don't kill you for that. Yet he, he was killed. And I, I thought that was un, unfortunate, tragic. But what was even, or just as bad, was the fact that so many of my fellow Christians didn't seem to think it was, it was, it was, it was nothing wrong with that. So the, the concept of all lives matter came up. You know, black lives matter, black lives matter. And many Christians said, no, 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 all lives matter. All lives matter. And I thought that was just disgusting. How can you say all lives matter when he lost his life over $20? So, you know, I just thought that was horrible. So um, I started writing about that. And I realized that during the civil rights struggle, when I was growing up, you were growing up too, um, it took place in the Bible Belt, mm, come the on. place with strong, Christ, strong Christian values, the Bible Belt, right? Mm -hmm. And But the Christians in the Bible Belt were totally against their achievement for black people. And these were Christians. And, but then you go back a little bit farther, uh, the Christians in the Bible Belt were in full, full, uh, support, full support of the enslavement of black people. Mm -hmm. And they were Christians. Then you go back even further, in 1493, uh, Pope Alexander uh, put out a uh, uh, doctrine of discovery. Right. And he, he spoke for the Christian church. He was the Pope, but at that time, that was before the Protestant movement. So mm -hmm. he spoke for all Christians that, that were in the West. He said that if you go to an area like Columbus did, he came to, you know, he thought he was in India, but he was not in India. If you go to an area that does not have Christians, you can kill them, basically, take their land, enslave them, take all their resources, um, and et cetera. And, and, and so you have things like uh, the King of England was selling land in the States, or not the States at that point, to North America, right. to people in England. They, they'll come up with a piece of paper and say, hey, I own this, this plot of land. He didn't have the right to sell that land. That wasn't his land. It was already being occupied. It was already, you know, belonged to somebody else. So I just kind of brought all those things in, showing the hypocrisy and the fact that um, Christians have done harm to society, to the body of Christ, and the Christians 
So people who claim they're Christians are not necessarily following Christ. So that was my, my whole thing with that. Right. I wanted to talk about the church, the, the role of the church, the role of the media in portraying black people and people of color the way that they do. It's much better now, but the way that it was. Uh, the criminal justice system. All right. I went on how, um, well, for just an example, <clears throat> Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, he was Governor Reagan at the time, or he was he wasn't president, he was not on governor. Mm-hmm. He went to Philadelphia, Mississippi, to announce that he was running for president. Now, he could have went to Sacramento and announced. He could have went to Washington and announced. He went to Philadelphia, Mississippi. That place was only famous for the killing of civil rights workers. Right. Right? And there were two whites that got killed. And it caused a great deal of attention because, you know, two whites got killed, along with, I think, a, a black about right. African American, and they, the whites came down from the north, and so Reagan was saying, "Hey, I believe in state rights." In other words, to my way of thinking, he was saying, "You can treat this, treat people any way you want to. When I'm president, I'm going to ensure that that, that that's the case." And right. I think that he followed up on it. Um, so I want to show that that he had full support of, of Christians. He had, you know, the Christians supported him. They had a, a guy named uh, President Carter, who I believe was a Christian, but the the, the Christians abandoned Carter and went to Reagan. So right. I just went out. It's, a lot of the, the people that claim to be Christians are, are anything but. Right. And, yeah. and with, in that regard, right, uh, you, you spoke on Dr. King, and I remember Dr. King's uh, uh, letter from, uh, I think it was in Birmingham, Alabama, or, 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 right. or where he wrote where he was being criticized by the clergy for uh, right. having a social agenda uh, and being a Christian, they were saying that it's a contradiction that you can't be a Christian and oppose, uh, have a civil rights agenda where you opposing the government or that you asking for equity that that this is not that that you cannot do this. And and he he wrote the letter telling him that uh basically based on what you're saying. But why did you put? Why did you bring Dr. King into the analysis? Because, like I said, you you showing the uh, the effects of the prison industrial complex on people, and you humanizing the people in terms of like how they adjust. You you showing uh, right. the connection between uh, the church and as, as far as you perceive it to be in terms of uh, the least of these and their perspective towards the least of these, and, and as their doctrines say, they should be concerned with the least. Why did you bring Dr. King in this? Well, I think right before that, I talked about a, a guy that, who I can't think of his name, but he was uh, uh, returning from World War II, and he was on the bus, Greyhound bus, coming back, and he asked the driver, hey, let me stop and use the restroom. And the driver got mad, but I guess he let he stop and let him use the restroom. And then he called him a boy, and... And the, the soldier goes, hey, I'm not a boy. I just came back from the war, you know? And so the, the, he was talking back to the bus driver. So the bus driver gets to the town. He gets off and calls the police. The chief of police shows up, grabs the guy, and they uh, take him to the jail, and they put his eyes out. Mm. And then they pour liquor on him and to say he was drunk. Okay, so then they have this trial. The, 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 the police chief... Um, they don't, you know, no one does anything. Then the finally the federal government uh, steps in and, and uh, bring charges against him. Within five minutes after the prosecution, the trial, you know, the, the, the yeah. court proceedings in, yeah. the jury gets together. The, the five minutes later, they, they come back and say, not guilty. Right? Right. Um, and that was common, very common. This guy All lost right. his sight. He's a veteran and yada, yada, yada. Um, so then King is in jail. Go, oh, I said, I said I'd talk about King several pages later, probably. And how he was in jail, right? And some of the leading preachers in the town said, hey, if there are grievances that you have, you should go to court. But that's insane. That's absurd. That, that, that um, soldier, they tried the guy that did that to him, and they found him not guilty. That was common. Most of the time, they didn't even do anything to people that 
the KKK, they didn't do anything to them for all the, the, the people they killed or, or, or lynched and all that stuff. Um, Megar Evers was killed in, in his front yard. And years, years, years later, right. they finally, uh, you know, I mean, so that was coming. So my point was that King was right. He was right to protest and do what he's doing. And the people that told him, hey, you need to go to court, they were full of crap. They, they knew that, um, that nothing would happen. But there were a couple, of, I, I put this in, there were a couple of ministers, white ministers, that were true Christians. And they got run out of town because, you know. And one guy, I think he stayed, but uh, they put gas, uh, sugar in his gas tank. They, they bombed his house or threw bricks through his window. And they did all kind of horrible things for him. So, yeah, the Bible Belt is not a <laughs> place that people believe in the Bible. Right, Basically, right. is my point. I got yeah. you. And, and as, as we close out, what do you want our audience to know about uh, the least of these, are they the are they the the takeaway? Are they to the take it away that this is a Christian uh, book, a religious book? Are they take are they take away to be that this is a social commentary on the prison industrial complex? What are, what do you think their takeaway should be? Well, it could be all those things. Um, I think that we should. Think about the things that we hear. We, we, we're constantly told today that we're a Christian nation. But when did the Christianity start? Did it start in 1493 when they came over here and started, you know, stealing and killing? And or did it did it start when the, the, the Native Americans were, uh, were were forced off their land? The Trail of Tears. Did it occur when mm. blacks were brought over here to be enslaved for hundreds of years? I mean, when mm. did this Christianity? Christianity things start, um, and all lives matter. When did all lives start to matter? I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't see that. Right. I, I don't, I don't think all lives matter today. I don't think they've ever mattered in this in this country. Um, but I want people to see that um, first of all, we have an opportunity to change the way we do prison, and we need to start doing that. Otherwise, we're going to still have people come in. Um, not receive any type of training, go out, and then come right back in. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have resources for, uh, for them. We need to invest in schools, underperforming schools. We need to bring them up right. to par so that every student has a shot at being the best that they can be. Um, and we need to get back to the church. We need to, if you say you're a Christian, you need to start acting like a Christian. You need to start believing in what, what Jesus said, and you need to stop going to churches that preach the, the opposite. Uh, there are ministers, I, I, I think I mentioned two in the book, I won't call them out now, but um, they, were, they were anything but Christian ministers, although they were under people under the pressure that they were. Um, the abortion movement started because of opposition to, to uh, integration. <clears throat> Um, the, the leaders of the, the anti-integration movement, they couldn't get people to get on board until they found the abortion issue. And then people said, oh, yeah, yeah. So then they kind of uh, did the abortion thing. We're against that. And then, oh, yeah, we're also against this other thing over here, too. And that has worked completely um, ever since. People that oppose abortion tend to also be conservative on social issues. Um, not always, but that's a major part of that that um, that group. Okay. So my thing is, listen. Who do you listen to? Who are you paying attention to? Um, be careful who you who you follow. Okay. And, and Fred, uh, how can our audience uh, uh, get in touch with you uh, and learn more about your works? Well, my my my. Um, the book is available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. The ebook is on Amazon. It's only seven bucks. The ebook, seven dollars. Uh, I have a website, fredawin.com. Okay. So, those are my contacts. There you have it. The real news, rattling the bars. 
this is not an interview about a religion. This is not an interview about uh, someone's opinion. This interview is about humanity and how we look at humanity. And Fred gave us some insight to, from his own experience from the, being in the correction system as a guard, a case manager, and a librarian. And in, the, in, and in these three areas, you see the prison system from the ground up. And he was able to give us, bring us some insight into how the prison industrial complex impacts people and how it doesn't invest in their return to society. But more importantly, how we take our belief systems and interject them into uh, the prison industrial complex or into society to oppress and suppress people. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for uh, this enlightened interview, and uh, we, must, we wish you much success in your endeavors as you go forward. Well, thank you for having me. Have a great day. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.